I mean, you do, huh? All right. <laughs> now, hang on to your horse coats because we're going to be using them until about Christmas when we start again. We'll be using the same four horoscopes. And, uh, all right, we're trying to look at personalities. And uh, I gave two pages to each, double spaced, and so on the pages you can. Uh, uh, the, on the pages you can scribble on there and look at what things I want. Break the sentence down and see, see what it means. All right, we're looking first at the uh, female chart. And Mark has all the way until Christmas to guess who they are. This one I don't think he will guess at all. Uh, you, or you know already who it is. <laughs> All right, let's look at the first sentence. Personality is wise and balanced, and their physical features are likely to be symmetric. Those are all, that's just all the whole business of poise and balance and symmetry is all labor arising. In the next sentence, we start looking at Mars in the first house. She's likely to be energetic and fit. And the fitness is due to a, the philosophy of uh, discipline. The philosophy of discipline is that Mars in the first house is trying to Pluto in the ninth house. And Mars Pluto are vigorous physical discipline, carried out by a regimen of vigorous exercise. All fairly simple. Third, sen third sentence, despite these martial tendencies, she's likely to present an image to the world of someone stylish and tasteful, meaning to say that the Libra part probably dominates over the Mars part, uh, because the ascendant usually is more important than a, uh, than a planet in the first house, unless that planet is also uh, conjoined to the ascendant. Do you have any sentences on this? Judith, no, you didn't have an assignment. Luana, it's up to you. Okay. Um, likely to be balanced, tasteful, and poised. She strives to maintain a pleasing aesthetic in the way she presents herself to the world. Excellent. Perfect. And then I have uh, some other ones. Okay. But, okay. Um, this, this has to do with the Venus. I am sensitive to the world's perception of me. I want to be loved and admired by everyone. No, actually, no, this is not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mars and Libra in the first house tends to want to appear flashy, whether it is flashy or not. Mm -hmm. I know all about that. I have Mars and Libra in the first house. If I can dazzle and look flashy, I'll try. But uh, <laughs> it does not work that way. Um, I speak with refined, dignified articulation that may at times seem inspired. All right, you're talking about the uh, Mercury trying the ascendant, or uh, the trying to the yeah to the Moon and Capricorn. Oh, okay, all right. And Uranus. Right? Okay. Well, you're going into the whole chart, not just the first personality. I was going to the aspect to the ascendant. Oh, okay. So, all right. All right. I need to feel needed or that my existence somehow contributes to the good of the world. All right, and you're getting that from where? That one isn't obvious to me. From Venus in Pisces. Oh, okay. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, I know how to use my looks and the power of my femininity to my advantage. Okay. Um, let's see. I feel the most beautiful when I am actively loving others or selflessly serving someone. Excellent. That's that's uh, uh, very true to uh, what I have found with this combination in the past and to this person. And this person did have something of an arrogance about her also. Okay. A love in early childhood with concrete values? All right. I would say a vigorous early childhood, loving but uh, vigorous for sure. So there's a certain amount, a certain element of pride when Mars is in the first house that goes along with all of the loving qualities. All right, let's look at some more here. Um, her physical energy will not be brutish. 
but neural in nature, as she tends to be quite mental and an intellectual person. We're talking about the fact that um, the whole personality is focused through airy signs, and that's where you get the neural quality and the mental quality and all of that, and the Saturn-Mercury being uh, trying to descendant in those things. It is a, oh, in fact, she, she loves, uh, missing me. In fact, she loves the subtle will-of-the-wisp air element and might even see herself as a fairy or some other kind of nature spirit. Mm -hmm. That's all just having to do with the simple airy signs and the fact that there's a very imaginative and fanciful uh, Venus in Pisces that rules the ascendant. It is a personality that is willing to initiate, though it prefers to act responsibly, but it is unlikely that she would act aggressively or offensively. We're talking, again, we're clarifying more for Mars in the first house. That likes to act, but in Libra, usually one acts by responding with, to what others do, and so we can see that, and there's enough in the Libra to tame the Mars so that it's not offensive, especially since Mars has uh, positive aspects to it. There's always a possibility of personal egoism, but the economy of strenuous exertion does not allow the luxury of doing much of that. Again, meaning to say that this Mars in the first house, she's putting out a lot of energy in order to put out a lot of energy. Uh, it doesn't allow you a lu the luxury of just goofing off. Now we get to start the tape. Ah, uh, this has been going, but I... That's all right. I don't think we're going to do anything if we're shaking importance here tonight. Uh, because of faith that borders on certainty and an aspiration that is absolute, she is able to face the world with a courage that is not always present in artistic types. Uh, the faith that borders on certainty is what Pluto in the ninth house is like. The positive pole of Pluto is will, and the negative pole is faith. And it's a very positive aspect, and an aspiration that is absolute. And the aspiration is, again, the whole ninth house. She's uh, wanting to reach up for something higher. And because of that, that energy radiates forward in the zodiac to Mars, and that gives her the courage. Uh, and this is unusual because Mars in Libra is often the uh, signature of somebody who is physically a coward, but with such a nice aspect like that that is somewhat nullified. This is especially remarkable since the disposition of her personality is not merely artistic. It is artistic with a rare ascetic sense. Now we're starting to bring in the Libra, uh, the Venus into all of this. The rare ascetic sense is the uh, Venus in Pisces. She's sensitive to delicate and air-drawn things of the world, but also to the sad and su su uh, sacrificial. Venus in Pisces is extremely sacrificial in nature. Lucky you didn't have to write the census for tonight. You, you had to write about you're not your most favorite emotions. Well, I have Venus and Taurus, right? But it's in the sixth house. Uh, I like sacrifice. <laughs> I like sacrifice. <laughs> I'm so sacrificial. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Her delicate taste brings her to function in the world as an artist, an artist with soulful qualities who will try to squeeze the last bit of love and beauty from a situation much as one squeezes the essence from a rose. That is the uh, perfect description that I have uh, found for Venus in Pisces over the years. It's from an old statement that says, the rose never smells as sweet as when it is crushed. Mm. And that is mm. the kind of character that Venus in Pisces has, only stated in a better way, I hope. Mm. She likes to mix it up with the world with plenty of give and take, 
uh, more than one would expect from an artist, but less than one would expect from an athlete. You're trying to, I'm trying to be real clear, I'm trying to be fine point in this sentence about the Mars and Libra in the first house. Mm -hmm. It is not quite athletic, but it likes the give and take of the scales going up and down and such like that. It's a, it's a, real, uh, it's a real challenge, you might say. All right, we're getting hopefully to more meaningful sentences here. Besides seeing beauty in the world, she probably sees the world as a beautiful sphere of dynamic energy, which is best appreciated with dynamic interaction, spontaneous if possible, even if her emotions might be so delicate that it would seem to be that it would seem to be impaired or injured in the process. So that this is, this is another, not a fully fine sentence here. Seeing beauty in the world is Libra in the first house. What you see in the world is what your ascendant indicates. Ah, uh, she sees it as a beautiful sphere of dynamic energy, the dynamic energy being Mars. And it wants dynamic interaction. Spontaneous if possible. Uh, well, let's see, I don't know where I'm coming with the spontaneous part. The Mars, Mars is like in the spot. Newness would probably be a better word than spontaneity. New. Yeah. Mars likes new things, like the new car smell and things like that. Or virgins. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, that, that really is a martial thing. Oh, I believe it. It is a martial thing. Men want that virgin thing. And, so if you have a, a religion or a religion that's based on uh, winning so many versions, it has something to do with uh, martial tendencies. But that may be necessary because that is a religion I'm thinking of is Islam. And that is a religion that is a very Venusian religion. It's a, extreme because they do all of their worship on Fridays. And if you look at uh, Muslim men, they're not tight, muscular men usually. Right. They're, they're usually soft, and there's something there with that uh, virgin thing that uh, counterbalances the other. All right. This is what. This is why. Oh, not what. It's why self in. Uh, it's, uh, Self-control of her body is so important in that it helps her to get the most out of the world with the least likelihood of injury. When you have Mars in the first house, even with it conjoined to the dragon's head, there's always the possibility of injury. Uh, I had it when my Mars in the first house was aspected. I had a football injury. Uh, right down, I could almost fall down to the day. Next sentence, energy acts as a counterpoise to her life in the world. If she becomes too aesthetic, she becomes either obsessed with mastery or carelessly romantic and daring beyond improvisational Elon. But if she becomes too forceful, she loses good taste and discrimination to dash without discretion. <laughs> she's cheating, she's picking up on my said Dash is dash without discretion is uh, a very good set of keywords for Mars in Libra. Uh, it's in its detriment there. It likes mm -hmm. that dashing thing like wearing a uh, tight armor or something like that, but it doesn't have good discretion. But you get it, what I'm trying to I'm trying to look at the balance between the martial factors in this horoscope and the Venusian factors. Venus does control the ascendant, but if you start tallying things up, Mars is a pretty strong Mars. So there's, there's a lot of balance between the two. It isn't overly martial, it isn't overly Venus. Do you have any more? Yeah, I have a, a question about, about Mars. I'll read you my sentence about Mars there. It says, um, I initiate various relationships with men. Through them I learn who I am as well as who I am not. Yes. And is that accurate for yes. Mars in first yes. house? Yes. yes. She's willing to initiate with men. In fact, she's uh, uh, even uh, aggressive about doing so. She was a flamenco dancer for one of her professions. Oh. Yeah. And she was a, uh, how do you say it? 
an eroticist for another one of her professions. <laughs> she really says, hmm, this is, we'll look at this even more. <laughs> she likes new things. This is Mars again. Oh, well, we can do 16. Her first impression of things, the first impression of things is what you get uh, from the Ascendant. Her first impressions of things depend on how interactive she is with them. If she maintains equipoise, she can bring imponderable will to bear on them. If she gets off balance, especially in retreating attitudes, she is likely to overdo things and become melodramatic about them. Uh, we're talking here about the melodrama coming from Venus, so that uh, if she, uh, so she gets too romantic, she's going too much in the Venus side of things, and that's when things get prob become problematic. She likes new things, Mars in the first house always does, and she can generate new things with artistic ease. But she loses her sense of creative poise if she tries free improvisation. Uh, we're talking here about the uh, moon Uranus uh, messing up, uh, the, the Venus or, uh, messing up with uh, Uranus and the moon messing up with the Ascendant. And the two, Uranus and the moon, are in conjunction. So we're getting a little bit deeper. We're looking into factors. We're looking at the Venus aspects now and how they affect the Ascendant. So she's very good at creation. She likes to initiate new things. But if she tries to get into spontaneity, or, you know, it, it results in melodrama. The Virgo and Pisces is the pole that is melodramatic, and we Venus and Uranus, those are things that are likely to come up. This is because she gets into too many push-pull complications that cause her to either put on a show to save face with little courage, or to stir up a froth of emotional turbulence, looking at the negative side first of Mars and then of Venus. First, the push pull is ob obviously the Libra in the first house. The put on the show to save face is Mars in the first house, has to save face and has to cover up to the fact that it may be a coward. Her physical health should be excellent, provided she lives a rhythmic life of physical culture and faith in the natural strength of her body. Uh, the rhythmic part comes from the Libra, and the physical culture is Mars in the first house, again with the trine. But if she has faith in her physical body and that it's going to do what it's made to do, uh, it's more likely the positive is going to come out. And if she avoids treating herself to decadent luxuries, which we're now looking at the Venus in Pisces, which could blunt the sharp edge she has on life, meaning to say that she could be, become rather soft. In general, her personal style should be tasteful, provided she can avoid extremes and does not overwhelm others with the power, uh, I changed that sentence and I didn't get that, of her personal being. Is this person dead? Yes. She should get plenty of first-hand experience of life, and she should learn many things by actively doing them. That whole first phrase is Mars in the first house. They should begin in early childhood, and with training should not abate throughout life. All right, it's all pretty good. The training comes from Pluto. In the last sentence, Work and activity suit her well, and through them she should remain youthful. Mars in the first house remains youthful, and her personal life should be excellent because she goes out to meet things. She is only likely, likely to personal difficulties through indirect activities. That's pointing at Venus, which is the ruler, and that's indirect. Which tendencies are to indulgence and are minor and not as firm as a potential enthusiasm. We've come to the conclusion finally that the Mars is stronger than the Venus. Do you have anything more you'd like to put on top for Boston or anything like that? Oh, okay. Was she primarily a dancer? No. No, we haven't talked about what she was primarily known for. We have till Christmas and you're guessing now.
<laughs> Damn. He doesn't even, he's seen this horoscope before. Well, I have it. Yes, you have. Well, I have. <laughs> <laughs> 1903. <laughs> you know who it is? Any even style? No. no. She's Parisian. Yeah. Huh? She's Parisian. Born in Paris. Yeah. Oh, born in Paris. Born in Paris. Uh, 1903, born in Paris. Yes. An artist. Oh, who is that? <laughs> oh, he's he's close. They I, I know I must have heard of her. I can't think of the name. I will tell you what her famous work of erotica was. The title was called The Delta of Venus. Oh, wow. yeah, a nice name. A nice name, yeah. I, I thought of a nice name. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Who? A nice name. Yeah. She was a. Uh, Psychiatrist. She was a, a psychoanalyst. She was a radical. She was a, a flamenco dancer. She wrote a sexual uh, renegade. Yes, she, it was a sexual renegade, and she wrote erotic literature in order to make money to stay alive. And she was the girlfriend of Henry Miller, the famous pornographer. And she had a very interesting relationship with her father. Oh yes. To, yeah, kind of a steamy. Well, you have, have to tell us all the details. Yeah, one. And with her brother too. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, Mars in the first house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Huh. All right, let's look at the other horoscope. This one, Mark, Mark already knows. He's, he's, he's just looked at it and he's got, he got it right off the... Uh, <laughs> um, Dale says, what's going on here? Yeah. This is... This is uh, of almost a favorite class for me because there's interaction with everybody in the class, except she's kind of tired tonight, so we, we won't. Uh, how many hours are you working away? 60? Mark, do you really know this is No, I don't. 1916 Watkins, Minnesota, male. All right. There you go. All right. This is a complicated personality with its many faces, its quirks, and unpredictable impulses. Hmm. Any, uh, you see where I'm coming from with that? There's two planets in the first house, actually three planets in the first house, which indicate all kinds of complication. And the many faces, the moon is, you know, in with Uranus and it takes on it's a sort of a double Uranus by the conjunction and by being an Aquarius. So it's, it's quirky and unpredictable. Is it some kind of politician? Yes. His outlook on the world is likely to be broad, progressive, and humanitarian. He may not even know how to present his humane feeling his humane feelings, and because of that, may be seen as different. Again, we're talking about the Aquarius here. He has these humane feelings, and he's probably very progressive, might even be too weak. Uh, futuristic would probably be better. He's uh, way, way ahead of the times. And he may not know how to present it, because, you know, you get boggled by that much Oranian intuition. Mm. He is likely to be physically energetic in an athletic way, and he may be able to sustain his energy while not feeling comfortable with it because the pride in it seems contrary to his humanitarian personality. We're talking here about Mars opposite the Ascendant. That gives a lot of physical energy. Uh, but he's not comfortable with it because it's, you know, it's a martial pride, almost uh, aggressive kind of thing. And it seems not quite humanitarian. He was a baseball player. He wrote about playing baseball in something like what they have a home talent league here. Uh, he played the base, that kind of baseball. His personal mean might seem irregular because his, he is so impulsive both intuitively and emotionally. Very simple sentence. We're talking again about the, the mean is the personal appearances. And that's the Uranus conjunct uh, the moon. And uh, so that it seems very impulsive. Jerry knows who it is already, huh? Mm -hmm. well, I thought you knew all the ball players. Uh, he wasn't professional though. 
He is likely to present an odd figure to the world, taller than average, with fast, irregular actions and mannerisms, which to some would border on spastic. He was indeed tall. Uh, Uranus in the Ascendant tends to be a little bit taller. Aquarius usually is a little, little bit taller than average. And when Uranus is in the first house, there are a lot of first, uh, fast, irregular actions. I once uh, ate watermelon with a man that had Uranus in the first house <laughs> that was an astrologer. And I was astounded at how fast he could put watermelon down. It was almost like he's putting his face in it. And it it was real fast, fast eating habits. And he said, well, that's just, that's just my Uranus in the first house coming out. Mm -hmm. He didn't even spit seeds. Right. <laughs> his humane attitudes are born of daring generosity, which seems unbounded, which in turn cause him to be optimistic and see the world with unusual optimism. We're talking here about Mars again, and we're talking about Jupiter, because Jupiter is sextile the ascendant. And uh, he's futuristic in a peculiar but benign way, so we now have it narrowed down that there's something, something of benignity in it. Do you have something, Gwen? Great. Okay. Um, let's see. My emotions are so complex and unpredictable that at times I don't know where they come from or what thought triggers them. But I also experience the opposite, moments when my emotions are crystal clear. Mm -hmm. Excellent. My actions may seem completely irrational to others, but I usually have some kind of intuitive logic behind them. Yes. Some people think I'm a genius. Others think I'm just crazy. Uh, yes, more people thought the former than the latter. Though. Okay. Um, a humanized, humane, humanitarian mother and or early environment. Yes, I don't know. I don't know that for sure. I, I don't. I don't know the, those details of his life. I'll probably look them up after I do some of the writing. Mark knows who it is already. You got it. Uh, I have several guesses. There are only so many famous politicians from Minnesota. <laughs> is it Harold Stassen? No. No. Uh -huh. Well, I could guess some more, but I'd just be running down the list. Okay. <laughs> Harold Stassen didn't play baseball. Well, I don't know. Well, then, then. Uh, he was probably quite bright as a child, but perhaps not as much as a prodigy. And he might have been shy or timid about his mental observations, which when combined with his gangly awkwardness, might have caused him to be so different as to almost be an outcast. We're talking about Mercury in the first house here. Uh, that's usually a bright early childhood. Uh, but uh, not as much as a prodigy, meaning to say it's the third planet in the house, and it's pretty deep in the first house. And he's shy about a lot of his ideas, and doesn't always say them, and the gangly awkwardness is again the uh, moon conjoined Uranus in, in the ascendant. He might endeavor to present his humane insights to the world to help change it, but when he does, he can come across as someone casual and informal, whether he intends to or not. Uh, Uranus is always informal. Jupiter, Jupiter sextile has a quality of casualness and being at ease about things. All right, you've got some more. Um, yeah, I did some stuff with the Mars. OK. okay. So a friendly demeanor when approaching a problem that masks a self, the, the demeanor masks a self-preservation need, or a need for control, okay. or domination. Okay, a, a desire to be regarded as fair, unbiased, altruistic reformer. Okay, yeah. But uh, uh, I vacillate between a philosophical attraction for emotional freedom and the need to be in control, even to dominate others. Okay, yes. He never really much, never really much uh, gave in to the need to dominate others, but it was there. Okay. And an, an oscillation between the desire to bear himself to the world without restraint and the fear of losing control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it now, Mark? Come on, Neil. No. Ah. <laughs> All right. Kiwi, kiwi. Exploration.
ancient time. <laughs> he is instantly responsive to immediate circumstances and can even deal with emergencies provided he does not take too forceful or dramatic actions. We're talking here, uh, the instant responsiveness is the Uranus in the first house. The uh, emergencies as Uranus conjoined the ascendant and Mars opposite the ascendant uh, both have to deal with emergencies and he has to be careful though just about not being too forceful. It is one of the ironies of the world that someone so humanitarian and altruistic should because of the extremity of these views be viewed as an oddity and mm -hmm. separated from the masses. We're talking about a personality that is too stand out to be, uh, mm -hmm. to be uh, easily accepted. Mm -hmm. This is someone who will vig vigorously maintain his views of the world. He will not stagnate because he will always be finding new things and new outlooks on the world. Now here we're looking at redundancy. Mars likes new things and Uranus likes new things. And when you have that kind of redundancy, that makes the tendency all the stronger. So we're, talk we're talking here about somebody that really is new and modern. All right? His emotional openness, which is the basis of his intuitive nature, will inspire his mind to the degree that he is almost overwhelmed by it. But, but not so much by, by it, but not so much that he will, uh, not so much be, that he will not be highly articulate and persuasive in his eclat. He's a very bright man, extremely mm. bright man. Mm. I have a, uh, a, a CD with him on it sharing a um, stand-up comedy routine. He was that bright. He could be very insightful. Um, the emotional openness is the moon? Yes, the emotional openness is the moon. And the inspiring of the mind, maybe say that those intuitions come first and they sink into Mercury in the first house. All right? Yes, and more than that? Yeah, but, but they've, everything's been said of what I have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you put all that work in, you want to have your day on stage. Oh. Okay. My innermost feelings can at times be transparent to outside observers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, moods are inconsistent, and they often di dictate the dynamics of his interactions with the world. Okay. Sees the world through the lenses of his emotions. Mm hmm. Oh, I need to get the feel of things before I can rationally understand them. Yes, but uh, he's not that, you're working with the emotional nature, but he's not that extremely emotional. Okay. He's not a sudsy type of person, because there's so much fire and air in here that he's not really sudsy. What you're saying is true, but if you want to refine the description, you have to take that into account. Okay. Good. Sudsy would be water. Water. Sudsy would be water. Yeah. How, how about could he be highly egoistic if he identifies too much with his brilliant aspects? Yes, he could. But he didn't. That, he didn't allow that to happen. Uh, he was somebody that was always eager to be doing new things and eager to be doing and to get them going. Got it, Mark? Mm -hmm. oh. So he's a politician? Yeah. A, a, a nationally known one? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. People might feel uncomfortable around him because his of his intuitive longing to be awake and aware and alive in the moment, mm -hmm. in the present. Mm -hmm. that you're That's all about Uranus in the first house. Mm -hmm. All right, now we move into something different with sentence 15. There is a deeper, darker, more moody presence in the background. We're talking about the co-ruler of the ascendant, Saturn, which conflicts with his more upbeat personal atti attitude. But it is not so strong as to contradict it. 
and only adds a serious and stately stature to his personality, he is not just some kind of insightful freak of nature. Mm -hmm. All right. mm -hmm. that's, that's a reasonable sentence for bringing Saturn in and balancing everything we said about the Uranus. Saturn's in Cancer. What? Oh, I was just, nothing. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. Because Saturn's also at, like in Cancer, so it's not very strong. Here I won't either. let him go up then. Oh. Huh? I won't let him go up. He's young. Yeah. All right, we are. Uh, He can take the initiative suddenly like lightning, and he is likely to prosper in doing so, provided he is not too forceful. But even in force, his pride in doing shines through. I'm talking about the 30-60-90 triangle between the uh, planets on the ascendant, the planets in the second house, and the uh, Mars in the opposition. They all form that triangle, and that's this. This is a sentence to try to describe that uh, mm. that activity. Sometimes he may be inclined to show his feelings to the world too freely, and because he is so frank and so free about it, about them, it could be embarrassing because his feelings are so noble. But because his feelings are so noble, he has nothing of which to be ashamed. I think that's fairly obvious. The showing the feelings to the world is the moon in the first house. In doing so freely is both Uranus and Aquarius. The frankness is the moon opposite the Mars. There's a frank feeling in Mars opposite the, the ascendant. It could be embarrassing because, you know, most people don't show everything. But his feelings are noble. And we're talking here about the second, sixth house to the planets in the third house. He has nothing uh, of which to be ashamed. I didn't even end that one with preposition. <laughs> I could have said to be ashamed of, and I don't, I don't like those constructions. She's, she's the grammarian. She's, she is a writer, excellent writer. All right. His mother must have been a strong presence and influence in her life, and her uniqueness must have contributed to his. We're talking about the moon in the first house. Uh, the mother figure and being conjoined to Uranus is very unique. His love for new, modern, and futuristic things, which may be, seem odd because or uh, odd only because they are new, may cause him to be an initiatory, uh, initiator. And though he is not without leadership abilities, his seeming, different seeming personality might be too much for him to be accepted as a leader. All right, we see the, again, the uh, Uranus planets in the first house are all the modern and futuristic things. And the Uranus there, his things seem odd because they don't fit into the background that we're used to. Uh, may cause him to be initiatory. There are all kinds of initiatory things in the horoscope, and especially in regard to the personality. The Mars opposite the, opposite the ascendant. Uranus can be initiatory, and the planets in the second house sextile to the ascendant are initiatory because Aries is a very initiatory sign. Got one or two more? Um, let me see. Attracted to gadgets and breakthrough technologies. Um, let's see, his, his eyes can seem wild. Yes. Expression is usually open, even though he's a bit shy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. This good description of him. Okay. Potential for transcendence through unconditional altruistic love. Okay. That's it. Okay. His intuitive insightfulness of things in the environment, in the external world, are expanded and become the basis of a broad sense of humor, which, though proud, is not offensive. We're talking here about the uh, 
planets in the ascendant sextile to Jupiter, especially Jupiter being very close to exactly sextile. So is that the sense of humor? Is yes. The, the Jupiter? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But his were sharp insights. Mm -hmm. uh, Jupiter usually, uh, in terms of humor, there's Saturnine humor and Jupiterian humor. Mm -hmm. And Jupiterian humor is usually overstatement and uh, understatement, or, or like when they say brevity is the soul of wit, is usually Saturnian humor. When you take something that is, you know, understated, understating something that really is terrible, uh, is is a different kind of humor. Uh, so this would normally be over. Uh, uh, overstating things, but because it's so, it has a little, it's hooked to those little insights of intuition, it doesn't overstate, it just uh, states it for what it is, and when you see it with perspective, Jupiter is a planet of perspective, that's what seems funny about it. Jerry knows who it is? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Those are politicians, I have no idea. Though there is originality and impulsiveness in the personality, there is also a solid stability in his humanism so that disruptions and interruptions do not undermine his health, but it would do him well to be aware of taking in too many spicy foods or he might end up with a tender digestion. We're looking at the rulers, both of the rulers of the ascendant there. The tender digestion would be the... Uh, Saturn in Cancer, mm. and because there are so many positive uh, aspects, uh, and he thinks you know one of the biggest factors of health is being positive and having a good attitude about things, and since he does that so well, he's likely to have good health. But Oranus indicates that there's a likelihood of being taken into spices and things like that. All right. Overall, it is not a garden variety personality, but it is not outrageously different either. But difference is often in the eye of the beholder, and he might seem too radical to the world and too unapproachable to many, and he might end up spending more time by himself as a loner where he's comfortable, though he, though he loves humanity. Yes, I need a lap sitting secretary that will do the typing and editing. Uh, not a garden variety person he indicates those different Uranus kinds of things but it's not outrageously different he doesn't try to shock anybody or anything like that but it's still too much for the world because the world doesn't always love Uranian types and he does in fact end up somewhat as a warner want a hint Mark? Yeah. he wrote a book of poetry and in it, he even describes or associates oh, his cop. Eugene McCarthy? Eugene McCarthy. Oh, Eugene McCarthy. Yes. Yeah. Oh. So the, the Venus in the third house would indicate the poetry. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. We did get out of here in under an hour. What, what do you think about that? <laughs> Unless you have some questions that... It wasn't even a Richardian hour. Yeah, <laughs> and the tape is even less than this. <laughs> this is the uh, next assignment is virtually the same as this one, and uh, except that it's two different charts. Mm hmm. Good. Yeah. Good. And so we're going to do after we done we're done with the personality. We're going to look at the emotionality, and then we're going to look at the mentality, and then we're going to look at the individuality. So and we're that, using the same charts for the using next the round. Using same charts for that. But oh, and then there will be oh oh oh, oh. Uh, the last assignment in this series will be summations, and then we'll go on and do something else. Did you get food? Where we sum up all of the different things, and so you can get. This a is like the picture. beginning of the advanced or the intermediate. The, the, the intermediate course goes much deeper and right. is much more thorough. It's like you in the intermediate course you you're building up a dossier on somebody, and in this you just you're just doing a snapshots. Quickie. Yeah, and right. But like it's yeah yeah yes. How did McCarthy get to be nationally famous with all the planets below the horizon? Isn't that a sign of somebody who will not become prominent? Uh he was a microcosmic man more than he was a macrocosmic man. 
he wasn't meant to be famous. He was meant to be himself, and he was meant to take care of himself. It was because he was so different that he never became famous. Uh, Jupiter rules the 10th house, and I've seen that where where you have a strong enough uh, Jupiter that there's a, that there, uh, a strong enough uh, ruler of the 10th house, and that's enough to make you famous. It hasn't done it for me. I don't think I want fame. I mean, that's built right into my uh, built right. You say Jupiter was the ruler of the 10th? Yes. And that was sufficient? That, that was sufficient enough to make him famous. It's pretty strong planet. It's exactly trying to Mars. So he's seen as a, as a vigorous idealist because of all of that. But not enough to make him president. Well, that's because the powers that were didn't want him to be president. He was vetoed by what's his name in Chicago? The mayor Richard of Daly? Richard Daly vetoed him. Yeah. So the personality is all the planets on the eastern and the, the eastern? The personality is everything that has to do with the first house. The assignment tells you that. Yes, right. Right. Yes. And but we're, but uh, then we're looking at aspects to planets what, in the now, What too. we're saying is that the, the physical body is more than just the physical body. There's a character built right into it. It's like the theory of Rolfing, that the shape of your body depends upon the uh, early childhood developments that affect the way that your body grows up to be and the way it grows up to be shaped. In the early childhood developments, if you follow uh, uh, occultists like Rudolf Steiner, uh, he says that the early childhood experiences are the direct carryovers from past lives, and that's how they get built into the uh, body in the first place, so that you carry a physical destiny with you from past lives through uh, basically traumatic and other early childhood experiences. Okay. Good. We will have a good time again next time. Okay. Hopefully it will be recorded. <laughs> <laughs>